Hey folks, welcome to video number 14. This time we'll be taking a look at the United States in World War I, subtitled The Fight for Democracy Abroad and at Home. Now, World War I lasted from 1914 to 1919. However, the United States was only involved on the battlegrounds for a couple of those years, and yet a lot of changes happened in the United States because of this war. Let's get into it. So, quick review of the causes of what was also known as the Great War in Europe. First of all, you had nationalism. Uh, a lot of the countries in Europe were devoted to their countries or their ethnicity within a country. And this is going to create competition between various countries and also competition within groups within the countries. A country like the Austro-Hungarian Empire had a lot of different ethnicities, a lot of different nationalities, and they'd be competing with each other for power and for attention. You also had imperialism, so nations were taking over weaker countries to expand economic, political, and military influence. Remember, the United States had become an imperial power as well, having taken over places like Hawaii and the Philippines and being involved in places like Cuba. You also had an increase in militarism. All these countries were developing their armed forces, particularly their navies, uh, and they were developing all sorts of new weapons for their other military branches. And they would use this as a diplomatic tool, basically give us what, what, what we want or else we'll attack you with our improved military. Now Germany's rise as a power in Europe uh, concerned European countries and worried other countries around the rest of the world. Germany for many years, for most of its history, had been a bunch of separate states. And finally in the 1870s they'd become one powerful country located right smack dab in the middle of Europe. And this concerned a lot of countries like France and Great Britain and Russia. And this concern over Germany's rise led to the creation of secret treaties between European countries and secret alliances between these European countries. So once the war began, uh, this led to the formation of basically two groups. You had the Triple Entente, or the Allied Powers. And the main powers in this were Great Britain, France, Russia, and Italy. This is the side the United States is eventually going to join. And they would face the Triple Alliance, also known as the Central Powers. Uh, and this featured Germany, the Austria-Hungarian Empire, and the Ottoman Empire, which is today uh, Turkey and a big chunk of the Middle East. Here's a map that breaks down the two sides. So the Central Powers, the Triple Alliance, are the red countries, and the Triple Entente, or the Allies, are the green countries. So World War I begins in uh, basically on June 14, 1914, when the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir to the Austro-Hungarian Empire throne, is assassinated by Serbian nationalists. And so these alliances, these secret treaties, take effect, and eventually... The, all these European countries have declared war on one another. And this is the beginning of four bloody years of combat. By the end of it, you're going to have 8.5 million soldiers dead, and you're going to have just shy of 40 million casualties, people wounded physically, emotionally, and countries just absolutely devastated. Millions of civilians are also going to be killed and wounded because of this war. But the United States remains neutral when it starts. We tried to not pick a side. Um, we were trading with both Germany and with Britain, with France and with Russia and all these countries, but the British Navy put up a blockade of Germany, and so this meant that we had stronger trade with Britain. German U-boats, or submarines, um, sank many ships, including ships that had American people on them, and this angered the United States. One of, the most, one of the worst sinkings was of the Lusitania, which was a British liner, and it was sunk off the coast of Ireland on May 7, 1915. And of the almost 1,200 dead, 128 of them were Americans. And this really angered the United States, and yet we continued to remain neutral. So the U-boats, as they were nicknamed, the German submarines, continued to sink other Allied ships, and they killed other Americans. But Woodrow Wilson, President Woodrow Wilson, backed away from any kind of military action against Germany because he did not want to be caught up in the war. In 1916, Wilson is re-elected as president, and in fact, he campaigned on the slogan, He Kept Us Out of War. And here's a newspaper that from the Washington Times, from when the Lusitania was sunk. And yet, shortly after Woodrow Wilson is re-elected, that we're going to get involved in the war. Why? Well, because Germany declared unrestricted submarine warfare. This meant they were going to open fire on any ship they saw in the Atlantic if they wanted to. There was also the Zimmerman telegram that the United States received from Great Britain. The Zimmerman telegram was a secret proposal 
from Germany to Mexico, where Germany proposed an alliance with Mexico against the United States, and Mexico would get back land that they had lost to the United States, like Texas, New Mexico, and California, in return. And the United States was not happy about that. Also, at the same time in Russia, their czar or dictator was overthrown. That meant the United States could now join the side of the Allies, and it could be seen as a democratic war, because the democratic countries, the Allied countries, would be fighting against monarchies like Germany and the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Ottoman Empire. So, on April 2nd, 1917, Wilson went before Congress and asked for them to declare war. And he said he wanted this war to make the world safe for democracy. So, Congress approved. The United States was now entering the war. So the army was sent over, and our military force was known as the American Expeditionary Force, the AEF. They had to organize for war. They were led by General John J. Blackjack Pershing. He got that name Blackjack because he'd been a commander for some black troops uh, in the United States military. Uh, the soldiers were nicknamed Doughboys, uh, and they came from all over the United States, from cities, from towns, from rural areas to serve together. Uh, a lot of them were drafted into the service as well. The Selective Service Act, which established the draft, was passed in 1917 and required all men to register for possible military service. 24 million men registered, 3 million were drafted, 2 million actually made it to Europe, and about a million and a half actually saw combat. African Americans were included in the draft too, and also enlisted on their own. We had uh, about 400,000 who served in segregated units, but they mostly had non-combat duties, working, working uh, latrine duty and kitchen duty and things like that. Um, but those that did serve in combat served very well, uh, served bravely. Uh, one of the most famous, one of the most decorated uh, re uh, regiments was the 369th Regiment, nicknamed the Harlem Hellfighters, and they served longer on the front lines than any other unit, uh, white, colored, didn't matter. They were on the front lines longer than any other unit in World War I. Women also served in vital non-combat roles. They were nurses, they were secretaries, they were telephone operators, uh, all of which are essential for any army to function. This was also a time when the I Want You posters featuring Uncle Sam made their debut. And Uncle Sam, is, as you may be familiar with him, uh, left an image. In, in many Americans' mind. Here's a picture of the Harlem Hellfighters, the 369th Regiment. And here's a recruitment poster for women uh, to enlist in the, in the student nurse reserve, uh, because obviously when you're in combat, you're gonna need nurses to serve on the lines and back of the camps. So America's entry into the war is gonna turn the tide in favor of the Allies. Uh, these American soldiers, though, are shocked by what they see when they actually get to the war. They see the effects of new military technology, chemical warfare, the use of gas uh, in the fields, the use of machine guns, the use of tanks and airplanes in combat just are devastating. Um, there are also new health issues that they deal. As you may recall from world history, uh, a lot of these battles were fought over trenches. Soldiers dug these deep trenches and then fired back and forth at each other. And in these trenches, you had all sorts of health issues. Trench foot, shell shock, which today would be known as post-traumatic stress disorder. People who go into shock from having been fired at and hearing all these bombings, relentless bombings. And soon the Central Powers were overwhelmed. The Austro-Hungarian Empire and Germany surrender. Uh, and uh, an armistice takes effect on November 11th, 1918 at 11 a.m. Uh, this is still a holiday today. In Europe, this is known as Armistice Day. Uh, in the United States, we changed the name to Veterans Day. So for the United States, we had 110,000 who died uh, in combat uh, and disease. We had uh, over 200,000 wounded. And you can look at the chart on the right to get a breakdown of how devastated uh, the countries that participated were. Uh, for military deaths. This doesn't count civilian deaths. You had countries like Russia and Germany that lost around 1.7 million. Meanwhile, the United States lost about 110,000. So, speaking of the United States, let's take a look at what was going on on the home front during World War I. So, during this time, the government is going to greatly expand its power over their economy. President Wilson uh, had direct control over many aspects of the economy and helped create many agencies 
to force contributions to the United States military effort. And this led to many collaborations between businesses and the government. You had groups like the War Industries Board, the Railroad Administration, the Fuel Administration, and the Food Administration that regulated what businesses uh, and, uh, and farmers could do uh, and making sure that they contributed to the war effort. So because of this, the U.S. economy is going to see massive growth and corporations in these fields are going to see their profits soar. Union membership is also going to greatly increase and at the same time you're going to have a lot of strikes, over 6,000 strikes uh, by union members protesting working conditions and also pay because they wanted their share of these increasing profits. There was also uh, a, a lot of back and forth over civil liberties. Um, you had victory loans and liberty loans that were sold to raise money uh, for the war efforts and to increase public support for war. They would have parades and rallies to get people to donate uh, to the war effort. You also had groups like the Committee on Public Information that worked for the, that was a government organization that created propaganda supporting the war effort. This also reflected this growing anti-immigrant and particularly anti-German sentiment in the United States. For instance, German language, music, and food were banned. German Americans were assaulted and even killed. You had the passage of the Espionage and Sedition Acts. What this meant was that anybody who was critical of the government or anybody who uh, was accused of interfering with the war effort faced fine and possible imprisonment. And what we see is over 2,000 Americans prosecuted uh, for violating one of these laws, including particularly labor and socialist leaders. African Americans, meanwhile, were divided on their support for the war. You had figures like W.B. Du Bois, who encouraged enlistment uh, of African American troops to go fight for democracy, uh, while others criticized this support. Why would they criticize this? Well, they said, why should we fight for democracy in other countries when we don't experience it at the United States? And we'll take a closer look at this in class uh, by some, through some writings from W.B. Du Bois. So here's some examples of some propaganda uh, used by the United States with that uh, gorilla, that ape that is uh, representing Germany. You can tell because it's wearing uh, a military helmet that a lot of German troops would wear and the club that has a German word Kultur on it. Um, you would also see propaganda like this. Notice Uncle Sam's hand reaching out, uh, telling that guy to be quiet. And criticism of society is not free speech. So, some other major changes are happening directly because of the war. Uh, for instance, you have the Great Migration. You're going to see hundreds of thousands of African Americans move from the south to the north uh, in very large numbers, heading to cities like Chicago, Detroit, New York, and Boston. They're going to head out west to St. Louis, head out west to L.A. Why are they doing this? Because there are lots of jobs up there, lots of factory jobs. They're also fleeing the South because they're tired of discrimination, they're tired of the violence, and they're tired of some natural disasters that are happening in the South. Now, they're going to face discrimination in these northern cities, too. Uh, and this, this, this discrimination is going to grow as the cities become overcrowded, and yet many of them prefer life in the North and the stability that it brought rather than in the Jim Crow South. Women also filled many positions that were left open by, by enlisted men, men who went and joined the military. Uh, women became railroad workers, they became miners, they became shipbuilders. Women also spoke out against the war. Prominent women like Jane Addams actually uh, did not want the United States to participate in the war. Um, women also were busy uh, helping the efforts for ratification of the 19th Amendment, for women's suffrage, for women's right to vote. Also during this time, there was a major flu epidemic, uh, particularly in the year 1918. And this was bad. It actually killed over 600,000 Americans, over 30 million worldwide. This actually killed more people in the United States than died and were even wounded in World War I and killed uh, more people worldwide than the actual World War I had. So here's a map that you can take a look at to see how the Great Migration worked out. Notice all the arrows pointing to cities like Cleveland, Detroit, Chicago, Kansas City, uh, even places like D.C. and Baltimore uh, and New York as African Americans moved in great numbers from the South. Here's a poster you would have seen back then where women were calling for the right to vote. They figured uh, if their sons, if their husbands uh, are going to war, uh, that women should have the kind of res if they're they should have that kind of responsibility to be able to vote, and here's a, a photograph of an effect of 
the flu where you had to close movie theaters, you had to close, uh, stop churches from meeting, you had to close schools because of how dangerous and how quickly this flu could spread. So once the shooting stopped, uh, there had to be a treaty ratified to figure out what was going to be the outcome of the war. And that treaty was the Treaty of Versailles. It was ratified in 1919. And it was mainly created by the countries nicknamed the Big Four, the United States, Great Britain, France, and Italy. The central powers, mainly Germany, were not involved in these negotiations. And in the end, this treaty punished Germany heavily. They had to pay war reparations. They had to pay back the winning countries, the winning allies, a total of $33 billion, an enormous sum, even today even by today's standards. They also had to accept responsibility for starting World War I, something known as the War Guilt Clause, even though Germany had not directly started the war. They were getting all this blame. Another part of the Treaty of Versailles created an organization known as the League of Nations, similar to today's United Nations. And this was a forum, a place for countries to discuss and settle their problems. They figured uh, the, the creators of the Treaty of Versailles, particularly Woodrow Wilson, figured this would be a peaceful way to resolve a lot of, country, a lot of issues between countries instead of using military. However, even though this was introduced by President Woodrow Wilson, it faced great criticism in the United States because many politicians feared it would drag the U.S. military and drag U.S. resources into future European conflicts. So the U.S. Senate, who needed to ratify the peace treaty for the United States to be a part of it, they didn't ratify it, despite President Wilson's efforts for them to convince them to do so. And eventually the United States would sign a separate treaty with Germany. So the end results of this, at least for the United States uh, and the rest of the world, Europe is devastated socially, politically, economically, especially Germany. The United States, meanwhile, because we were protected by our, our oceans, uh, we actually became the world's great industrial power because all the European countries were so physically devastated. However, even though we were powerful, we wanted to isolate ourselves from Europe and the world's problems. So here's a political cartoon that shows the end result of the Treaty of Versailles and the League of Nations, where President Wilson proposed it, but the Senate disposed of it and threw it in the trash. Thanks for watching. We'll be talking a little bit more about World War I in class.